when you're when you're building something for people to experience and you want them to slow down, I think you need to create that sense of placeness, that sense of connection with the place or with the characters or with the actions you do so that when they go back to it, it puts them in a mind state. It puts them in a place that's like a little bit transformative. But to get them to that place in the, in the, at the beginning of the experience, you need to cut them away from the world. And so in Journey, there's this sound that you hear, and then there's the cello sound of the solo. And then as it gets louder, you hear, you know, and you wake up. And then you're there in the desert and there's nothing except wind, right? So there's this feeling that's happening when you're in the start screen. And then when you move in, we have this sound and then it's more sound and then it's more sound and then it turns into noise and then it's silent. And that's when you start walking. And in that silence, the sound that you hear is the sound of your footsteps on the sand. And then in that silence, you hear the ruffle of the sort of fabric of your character. And then you start looking around and seeing the sparkles. And then you get up to the crest of the hill and you hear the cue and you see the title. And then you look out and you see the vista. And it's like, all right, I'm in a place now. So we took you out of where you were, your shitty job or your stupid mom or whatever it is that's like bugging you, the dumb budget that you haven't finished for work or whatever it is. And um, you were like, what is this thing? And now you're like, wow, this is a place. It's not just a system. It's not like I'm going to like get rewards or ping, 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 ping. It's a place. So I think that that notion of, of presence is, is the thing that knocks you out of achievement orientation. It knocks you out of your own experience and it puts you in a place that you can be contemplative. So I started talking to Kelly and Genova about Journey when I got back from a trip. So I was finishing Boom Blocks and I was in a relationship with someone else that worked at EA and we went on a hiking trip in Bhutan where I summited a 14,000 and then a 16,000, 16,5 peak in the Himalayas. And on that trip, while I was on the trip, I was going over the mountain, I realized that my relationship really wasn't fulfilling me or him, that I wasn't really that happy anymore working on games at EA, that I felt like, especially with small titles like Boom Blocks and My Sims, where the teams were really trying to do new things, it was hard to push against the system. And I started thinking like, all right, maybe I should look somewhere else. Like maybe I should start interviewing. And I got back and I kind of broke up with my boyfriend and then started talking to people about breaking up with EA. Uh, and it was a crazy time. And right around the time that I made this decision, Genova asked me out for coffee and we went out and he showed me the concept for Journey. And he was like, yeah, so I want to make this game about a pilgrimage to a mountain. <laughs> when I was, at the end, you'll feel this awe and wonder towards the unknown. And I was like, oh, damn. <laughs> I just, I just did, did that. That. <laughs> that sounds perfect. I totally love this idea. And at the time, it was going to be a multiplayer game, as in, like, maybe hundreds of people could play at once and all these ideas. And I started thinking about it, and I couldn't stop thinking about it. I think I just actually indicated here, I gave a talk about, about it, um, specifically the idea of agency that players currently feel, yeah, which is one of getting things um, and being rewarded for being smart and figuring it out and getting the power-ups and the bling, bling, blings and stuff versus um, being rewarded for spending time 
contemplating something, looking. Um, Walden, which is was here at Indiecade, Tracy's game, very much about you know this idea of contemplative play. And I also think Journey and Luna are in that same area, um, as is um, Proteus and a, a couple of other games that have been developed that are more experiential. I tend to try and work in the space that's more more gamey and more mechanical, as in like it's a system, but it allows for that contemplation and openness. What what I call it is white space. Um, I like the idea of white space in games, which is places where you can be doing something and you don't feel compelled to do it. You can just walk to the top of a sand dune and journey and just pan the camera around, listen to the wind, and watch the sun like on the sand, see the clouds in the sky, and maybe you'll see another character somewhere off in the distance or maybe you won't, but you can just be there and it feels good. When we were first working on Journey, I had a couple of features on my list as the producer that I really wanted. And one of them was for the world to be dynamic. I really wanted Journey to be a world that changed as you played it. I wanted the sands to shift. I wanted there to be weather and time of day really, really badly. Like the Sims part of me when I first heard the design idea was awesome. We're going to make this procedural world and there'll be weather and then you'll be traveling through it and people will get paired up and it'll be so cool because each journey will be different because it'll be a different world. Um, and I fought for that feature for like a year. <laughs> and every time we'd have a meeting talking about the landscape, I'd be like, and then when it, when we build the landscape generation thing and John and Nick would just be like, oh, it's going to be so hard. We don't have any, we don't have time and we don't have enough engineers to do that. And you got to pick your features, Robin, that's going to be too much. And I was like, no, 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 I really, we really got to do it, really got to do it. And over the course of working on the game, what I realized is that we didn't need to do it. Because the difference in each journey is the person that you play with, or whether you play with someone at all. And um, at our very first offsite, we were talking about, which is like maybe three months after I started, even two months after we started, we went to the Pismo Dunes north of... LA and we camped out there on the dunes one night and spent time in there running around feeling the sand, running in it, like experiencing it as a thing uh, so that we could get our heads wrapped around the idea of what, what we really wanted the game to be. And um, I was saying to the team, like, what it sounds to me like is that it would be like a museum. When you open a museum, there's this moment when all the paintings are new and there's all these people and, you know, it's like an it's like, okay, so-and-so's show is up at the, at the MoMA, let's all go, and everyone goes. And then over time, let's say a few of those paintings are moved into the permanent collection, and then they're there hanging in the permanent collection. It's no longer fanfare, you know? There's no longer, like, huge crowds, and there isn't a gift shop dedicated to that artist. It's just, like, you know, a couple of really nice Monets or whatever. It's like a fantastic uh, Jasper Johns just sitting there, right? And when you go back to the museum and you look at that painting, you remember the opening, you remember the artist's, like, body of work, but you're just focused on that one thing, it still has meaning to you. And going back over and over, that meaning matures and you change. And over time, it, it doesn't have to be the world's most popular painting. If, it's, if it meant something to you at the opening, it means something to you now. And it'll mean something to you when you see it on, you know, the role of film that you took 10 years from now. Um, or when you take your child to see it, or your grandchild, right? It'll mean something to you. And that journey was going to become a place that was like that. It was going to be a ruin that had just been discovered. And so there'd be tons of tourists and tons of people there. And then over time, it would become less and less populous, less and less visited. It would become a relic that people visit occasionally. And you can go back there and be like, oh yeah, I remember when we first discovered this place. It's great, it's still, still really beautiful. A little lonely now, like not really seeing anybody, but it would still really feel like this place, you know? There was a lot of argument about what, what, what the story should be and then how it should be delivered. And I think um, on any game that has a strong narrative component, whether that's a backstory that is revealed through play or a feeling that one wants to drive the player through, like, a, like an experience curve, which becomes the narrative, um, which Journey had both, um, there's always going to be a lot of opinions on the team about how to do it right. Um, we did a really bad job with the narrative for a very long time. Um, the narrative of Journey, the backstory of Journey, is not an unfamiliar one to anyone who reads a lot of science fiction. It's very similar to like uh, Ian Banks' Fearsome Engine. Um, there are a lot of sci-fi stories about a world where there was a civilization and then they got greedy and they destroyed themselves and now 
you're the, one of the last people on the planet or you're one of the people that survived or you're someone who's discovered the planet like an alien, you know, and you, you, you uncover this ancient civilization and possibly an ancient evil. Like, these are not new ideas, right? Um, and when you read the story of Journey, I think if you were to go back and read like Genova's very first pitch for what the narrative was, and then Matt helped him rework it a couple times, and then I started working on it, and then eventually the whole team was really invested in reworking it. If you were to look at it over time, you would see two things that are true. One is we told less and less, because it was really, we were really, there were some points where it was like, yeah, if we, if we, if we have that in, it's just gonna be like beating you over the head with this idea of like, you know, this greedy, evil civilization. And I don't want us to feel like the ancestors were, were terrible people. I don't want us to dislike them. I want us to have empathy with them because I, I want to create that feeling of empathy in every aspect of the game. Let's not demonize the prior civilization such that you can't empathize with them because then that's going to take away from the total ambiance of the experience, right? It's going to remove that emotion from the, from the ether. Um, so we told less and less. And also we told it more and more simply. One of my favorite books um, of all time, which I read every few years, is The Timeless Way of Building by Christopher Alexander. And he does, he's the sort of father of architectural pattern languages. He, he designed a bunch of patterns for architecture in the 70s and did a lot of work looking at naturally occurring patterns in buildings of people all around the world. And one of my favorite examples that he gives is the example of the entryway, which is when you go to a sacred place, you walk in, there's a gate, you walk in the gate, and there's a corridor. And you walk along the corridor, and then there's a gate. And you go in the gate, and there's a vestibule. And you go in the vestibule, and there's a landing area. And then you walk down the landing area to where the nave or sacred place is. And by the time you're there, you are so far away from the street that you were on, right? You are just, you are not there. You have, you've moved from the street through a garden to a gateway, to a covered space, into the foyer of a church, long past the pews and all the stained glass and all the sounds and smells of the incense and the candles and all the things that are there. By the time you get to the front and genuflect in front of the nave, you are transformed. And the space that you're in is transformed. You're in a different time and a different place. And like churches themselves are in many ways kind of a, they're a platform for making you be in a transformative place interiorly and sacred places in general, temples, when you go to Monument Valley, you know, and you see these amazing structures, if you walk in Bryce Canyon, you know, when you see these things, they take away so much of the stimulus of life. They're singular in their formation and they, they transform the light and the sound of everything in a way that is really, really altering to you as a person. It alters your experience, your, your software changes with it. So if you want to make a game that slows people down, you need to do those kinds of transformative acts. You need to build the equivalent of a hallway and a gate, and then the pews and the stained glass, and then at, one, at that one place, the pristine moment where you're collected. So there was a time when we had these animated cutscenes, and you would interact with the ancestor and then you would see something play out and we had these flashes, these images, and they were... It was just, I can remember playtests where we would be up at the Sony offices with... We had a room where we could sit and watch on five screens or six screens people playing. We'd see their feed and then we'd see a, a, a monitor of them while they're playing. And during the cutscenes people would just like look at the camera and just be like, really? What? You know, or they check their phones. That was a big one. Like during the cutscenes, immediately they put the controller down and check their phone, and then the, the cutscene would be going by, and they'd be like, "You're not seeing the story," and then they'd pick up the controller and go again. And during those playtests, yes, there were people on the team that said, "You know what? Fuck these. We should cut them. <laughs> like we should get rid of this stuff. It is so bad, and it's so hamfisted, and it's such a bad way to tell a story." Like. Nobody likes it, just cut it. And I'd be like, you can't just cut it. We have to do something. There needs to be a reward. So my feeling was, and I think Genova also 
really felt like there needed to be a way to understand what had happened. And Matt was really trying to come up with the right way to do it. And he did so many versions and worked so hard on it. And it got to the point where it really did feel like, wow, we're just going to screw this up with a bad series of images or a bad story. And everybody was depressed. And Matt stayed one weekend and came up with this idea of making a scroll that you would see the scroll over time in these pictures. And then when that idea came in, then suddenly people started brainstorming like, oh, well, what if you can see the scroll over time? And then like at some point, Chris had an idea where you could you could have see the, the journey of the character as it went through the scroll. You could see the other person. And then, you know, we started batting that around. And then we had that meeting where we all went to lunch and everyone said what they thought. And, and then suddenly it, it worked. And it, it really was way late in the game. It was way late. It was like maybe three months before we shipped that we really knew it was working. It was so <laughs> close, so close to the edge. And even then, we were developing that story as you went. And when you get to the fifth level and you see the scroll all around you in the top of the temple and you see each character going through, I don't think a lot of people really get that. I don't think that, what, that they get that what they're doing is unlocking the whole story that they've had and then seeing it but it creates this sense of imminent importance that there's something coming after the door when you leave the temple and go out to the mountain. It's so different when you leave that orange warm place and you go into the cold blue and you've seen this lighting up and this huge ancestors appeared and you get this really important sense of like now this is a mission. You've got to do this important mission. It doesn't really matter if you understood all the glyphs that you found in the game and you understood the little narrative that's playing out on that sort of comic book scroll of the ancestors basically extracting too much value from their world and driving the world underground through this terrible sandstorm that came from war. You, you don't need to understand that. You can just get the sense that there's an ancient narrative that's trying to be pieced together and that you will find out what it really means when you get to the end. When you put people into a position where they can compete with one another, they will. And we found there were a lot of places where, despite our best efforts as designers, we were still creating this invisible need to compare to each other, basically, to compare yourself to the other player. And so the first thing that we did was, after the playtest that I just described, we cut it down to two players because four players meant that there would be two against one or three against one sometimes or two two against two people would be kind of trying to drive the game in a certain direction like we should go over here no we should go over here and we had designed all these puzzles where you had to have all four players in this one place in order to move forward and it, it made people like I think Tracy was was the first player to sort of say this just she felt like I want to explore the world on my own and I don't want to feel pressured by the rest of the group who was like wants to speed run it you know, I'm a, she's like, I'm a narrative exploration person. I want to see all the things. And right now, I feel like I have to keep up with everybody, and that makes me feel sad. Like, I don't want to feel dejected about wanting to do what I do naturally. So if I were playing this, I would play it by myself. I wouldn't play it with other people. So we got down to the place where we realized if it was just two people, we could create more empathy because it would be you alone and them alone. It would be I and thou. And this was, you know, it revealed itself to us through the playtests. And then... After that, we did a bunch of design around movement mechanics and collection mechanics and puzzle mechanics, trying to get people to interact with one another. And we found actually that the number one thing that made people compete was the sense of accomplishment when they move the narrative forward. So that if you remove the need to solve together and you created just a companionship experience, where I could solve all the puzzles in the game and you could just be by my side, or I could play it by myself and never see you and still succeed, 
then the only way for me to interact with you was, was, was to be interested in being with you. If it was no longer that I could see you as a tool to my success, you know, you know, that I needed for my own agency you to succeed or to do something, then suddenly you're just with me, you know? It's like when you have a child, like you, the child is totally dependent on you. They're not an agent of your success. You don't see your own child as like a, a thing that, that makes you successful. You see it as a thing that needs you and you become its caretaker and you have genuine empathy for its experience. And over time, as it becomes an adult, that relationship changes. But your feelings about them are really grounded in the sense of togetherness that comes from seeing them as something that, that needs you so completely, but that is also going to eventually become independent, right? There's this change over time with a child. When we, we, when we engage in a gameplay session with each other and we're going through a series of challenges, what is the relationship over time? Either we're succeeding or we're failing. And like, if, if I don't, if I don't see you as needing me necessarily, but I need you, do I feel angry when you don't do the right thing? Do I feel like you're not really that, that nice of a person because you didn't do exactly what I thought? Those are the things that happen when you're a teenager and you become independent, right? You go through that phase of like, wait a minute, no, I'm gonna do it my own way, right? And I think a lot of games, they, they stay in that teenager range because you're, you're always aware of the system around you and how you want to sort of survive in it. But if you're playing, say, a multiplayer shooter and you need other members of your team to succeed, if they don't succeed, it's, it's a very different experience, you know? It's, it's, very, it's, very, um, it's very much grounded in, in a feeling of either you succeed or I'm disappointed. Either we win or we lose. And with Journey, we didn't want to create a parental relationship. But we also didn't want to create a sort of teenager relationship where there was a lot of resentment. And you know, we wanted to create this relationship of peers, colleagues, equals. Like, it's, it's hard to describe, right? It's hard to describe what that really means. But when you play, even if you play Left 4 Dead, you know, um, you're not really peers when you're playing it. You know what I'm saying? You're not really collaborating in that way. There's something really unique about the way that you collaborate when you play Journey. And so we had to have a lot of conversation about what does it really mean? Like, what does it mean to, to be in a relationship with someone and to not need them, but to want to help them, but for them to not be a child to your parent or for you not to be a child to their parent? What does it mean to be mutually engaged, but not dependent, not codependent? What is a healthy way to play through this game with another person that won't create the sense of competition or the sense of lack or a sense of a feeling out of control of the other person's actions. And that was a really hard thing to discover. And honestly, most of the stuff that we designed and put in the game initially, we cut. There were a lot of puzzle designs and a lot of ways of interacting that the more we looked at them and the more we experienced them while playing with each other, the less the less it felt like we were really getting to that sense of, of awe towards the unknown or a genuine connection between two human players. So on the process itself, what I would do is I would, every week or two when, when we were in a good times and, and sometimes once a month when we were in the bad times when the build was broken a lot, I would give everybody a piece of paper and on it it would say lover or fighter or neutral. And then we would play the game together, all 10, 12 of us, all connected. We wouldn't know who we were connecting with. We would each connect with one person in the group and we would sit down and we'd play Journey, start to finish. And there were times when we couldn't play a certain level, you'd have to just skip it, you know. But I would ask people to play as their character, like play as a lover, love this person, follow them around, be with them, you know, try to support them, you know, sing at them, <laughs> that kind of thing. Or if you were a fighter, try to try to grief this person. Like try to try to make them, you know, screwed up. Try to try to hurt them, you know, be that jerk. Um, and if you were neutral, just like play the game like you didn't even care. Just like whatever. If there's another person there, just don't care. And by playing the game in those roles, and then trying to guess who we had connected with, and then try to guess what their roles were, we realized that you could actually create a game where griefing looks like love. Like in Journey, if you just go around after somebody and you call them all the time, 
the way that it sounds and the way that it looks and the way that the music and everything else is building up around it, it's just kind of pleasant. Yeah. <laughs> it's just not, it doesn't end up being grief. It ends up being affection or attention, which is positively framed by the entire experience. And so those were the sorts of things that I did on the project to to get at the question of what is the feeling that we're trying to create? What is a true colleague? What is a true pairing? What is a relationship between two equals in an environment where there is a drama, where there is pushback, where there will be pain? How do I make these two people want to stay together? You know, what's a good marriage? When we were practicing talking about Journey, with the press people at Sony before we first announced it at E3, the woman that we worked with, um, who was really great actually, was asking us over and over these questions about religion and did we believe in God and like was the game about Jesus and this kind of stuff. And I was like, what are you asking these questions for? And she's like, well, have you played your own game? She was like, it's really, it seems like it's about religion. And I was like, well, it, in a way it is, but it's more about spirituality and really no game journalist is going to ask us about that <laughs> like, have you read modern game yeah, journalism like, <laughs> we're not going to get these questions like i wish we would yeah but th these are questions we would get on npr like we're not we're not going to get these questions and you know i was surprised honestly i was pleasantly surprised when the game came out and like keith at the guardian and you know people at the new york times and onion and stuff they asked those questions they did and they wrote about the game that way, and that was really awesome to me, that like we did make something that made people think about this sort of spiritual questions, these deeper questions, philosophical questions, which for me have been a lifelong thing. Like, I mean, I, I wouldn't have become an AI person if I didn't want to know why are we smart and how do we feel and like, what is a machine? Like, we made these things. Can they tell us stories? Can we, can we make them smart? Like, how, how, how is it relevant that we've created these strange not people that we spend all of our time with you know i'm really really fascinated by that it's amazing like how many people spend how many minutes every day now staring at their phone like there's we are with the machine now so much it's such a huge influence on us and like i'm fascinated by those kinds of questions and to be able to make a game that that even sort of scratch the surface of this question of what is technological progress like what what is the future and what is the past? Like, are we really gonna, are we really gonna get there? <laughs> are we getting to the place we wanna get to or are we getting to the place that the people in Journey got to? You know, it's a, it's a really, it's a really strange time now. It's interesting to wonder, you know, and maybe we'll look back at Journey and say, it's funny that we were making that game right when everyone was having this huge debate about global warming and we were in the midst of coping with this newly sentient kind of machine stuff that we were building that was becoming self-driving cars and you know machines that didn't need us like maybe we will look back at something like this and see it as a text you know on those issues of course then you get to the end and you find out that that what it really means is that you made it to the end that there is an end and then on the other side maybe everything's okay Maybe you're forgiven, maybe you get to heaven, maybe you, you forgive yourself, you know, maybe you find your partner, maybe you experience the dream of an alternate reality. Whatever it is that you see when you go through the light, that's you, it's your choice.
and then you forget about the story of Journey and what it was and who it was because it doesn't matter anymore. And the next time you go through, you're really on the path. I think the second time you play Journey is so awesome because you you have suddenly realized that it's a karmic cycle and that you're being born again and that their players are coming through again and that everything is part of the cycle of just it's a it's a remembrance. It's like almost like a it's a ritual of remembering what the world was and also being okay with it, you know? It's a cycle of growth and then death. It's a cycle of of tragedy and forgiveness. And it can be whatever you want it to be. Um, and that moment of just realizing, wow, I can go back through this whole world knowing now where I'm really going. And then you just think, wouldn't it be so cool if in real life you could do that? <laughs> Yeah. You know, it'd be so awesome. Like, please let reincarnation be true and please let me come back in almost exactly the same way as I am now so that I can truly appreciate my life and see that there is no point, that it's just a thing, that we're just moving. 